Okay, here we are, lesson four, and the last lesson in this unit. Absolutely. On collecting and presenting data. Today we're looking at bias in surveys. So bias in general is, of course, um, um, the opinions that we all have that are influenced or that are skewed in one direction or They're the other direction. They're leaning one way, yep. Yeah, um, but of course, statistical bias is... Is any factor that favors certain outcomes on responses, uh, has, hence systematically skewing the survey results. So a statistical bias is one where all of the results, all of the answers, all the outcomes that come in for your survey are leaning one way. And so the, the key word there, if you want to underline or highlight something, is that it's systematically skewing. It's not that everyone is going off in a different direction incorrectly. It's that there is something in the way that either the survey was generated or the sample was taken that is sort of pushing all the responses in one direction. Okay? And then often that's unintentional because mm -hmm. you can take whole university courses on how to eliminate bias or reduce bias in oh, yeah. surveys and sampling. Oh, um, but you know, as we've all seen, some people can deliberately bias surveys in order to get results they want. If, if you want to prove, a, you can prove anything with statistics yeah. if you know how to sample the group that you want. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So let's look at our first type. And uh, you know, as Miss Hughes just said, we, we've just finished looking at sampling in the last lesson. So let's talk about sampling bias first. Sampling bias occurs when the sampling frame does not reflect the characteristics of the population or when the sample does not represent the sampling frame. So this is why it's so important for us to choose an appropriate sample based on a good method. Because if everything's about characterizing and generalizing to the population, then we want to be able to do that in an accurate way, yeah. right? And so sampling bias basically occurs when you don't pick a good sample, yeah. right? So if I wanted to ask students at this school about their feelings of smoking, and I went out to the smoke pit to ask the questions, chances are my results might be a little bit skewed, yeah. especially if I'm trying to generalize to the entire population. Yeah. So that's one example. Here's another couple. So, so um, a survey ask students in a high school auto shop whether they own a car, whether they own their own car or not. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Well, I would say that if you um, look at the fact that usually auto is an elective. True. The students that take auto may have a higher interest in cars. Also true. And as a result, may place a higher priority on owning their own car. That's a lot of maze, Mr. Jackson. It is a lot it's of maze. It's not a certainty. And so that's what's more important, is that whether or not you agree or whether or not you disagree, it's the fact that whether bias could happen mm -hmm. that we have to look at, okay, because it could be there, do we really want to work hard on all these samples and on showing the data only in the end to realize, oh, yeah, okay, our results are biased, and that doesn't reflect the population at all. So in this case, it would be best to avoid this class and maybe look at other classes that are more representative of the population. Of the whole population. So what if we handed out surveys in the <coughs> school lobby on Friday afternoon asking questions about skipping school? Do well, you skip school? How do you feel about skipping school? So we do this Friday afternoon. So um, what's wrong with that, though? Well, I guess, you know... <laughs> The biggest problem is that if you're there on Friday afternoon, you are probably a person who is a little bit less likely to skip. Mm -hmm. So your feelings about skipping would mm -hmm. be different. And, and the frequency with which you skip is probably yeah. different. So the, the problem here is that the people that you could ask, the people who are in the building or your sampling frame, yeah. is not representative of your population. Because at that time of day, at that time of the week, anybody who would like to skip may be more likely to be out skipping. Yes. Exactly. So we, we're not going to be able to extrapolate to the whole population and generalize about them since our sampling frame is so biased. Hmm. So non-response bias is, is a, a different kind of bias. And basically when we talk about non-response bias, we, this occurs when particular groups are underrepresented in, in a survey because some people choose not to participate. So um, very often when, say... Um, doctor's office perhaps leaves um, a survey you know just on a desktop and says okay you know fill this out if you're interested 
you know, only certain characteristics of people, only certain types of people are going to fill out that survey. Mm -hmm. And most people will just ignore it altogether. Yeah. Phone calls are the same. You get a phone yeah. call during dinner and you're going to choose, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have time or I'm choosing not to participate in this. Or I'm choosing to participate because I'm interested Interesting, in what yeah. you're asking about. Yep. Those little yeah. pop-ups, please complete a survey when you're doing this online. Yeah. When you close the pop-up without doing it, then you that's non-response bias. So the, the results that they get yes. are going to be yeah. biased likely because of the non-response. So here's another example that we can think about a little bit more in depth. A science class asks every fifth student entering the cafeteria to answer a survey on environmental issues. Less than half agree to complete the questionnaire. So they've picked a great sampling technique. They've got a systematic sample. Mm -hmm. Right? The completed questionnaires come back, though, and they show that a high proportion of the respondents are very concerned about the environment. They're well informed about environmental issues. How is that sample well, biased? I mean, can't we just say that KCI is very knowledgeable and concerned about the environment? Well, in this case, because half the people did not agree to, to answer mm -hmm. the questionnaire, those people may be more likely to either not really know a lot and mm. not want to seem to be... Um, lacking information in this area, yeah. or maybe they they don't genuinely have an interest in the environment, or maybe they're just really hungry and they want to sit down and eat, so the environment is not on the high list of their priorities at this moment. For whatever reasons, that half that, you know, that did not agree, those people's answers we want, because those are people in our population. Mm -hmm. And so their choice not to fill it out may make it look like there are a lot more people who do care. And if you do care and you are well informed, then you're happy to answer you know, the questions on the survey exactly. and right, you know, before you sit down and eat. Yeah, exactly. All right. So measurement bias, measurement bias occurs when the data collection method consistently either underestimates or over underestimates the characteristics of a population. Now you had a really good analogy um, mm. about a tailor. Yeah. There, if you were to take even the measurement tools that are being mm -hmm. used, a tailor might have a measuring tape, a cloth measuring tape, uh, that he or she's been using for 10 years. And over time, the cloth stretches out little by little by little. Mm -hmm. So that what happens is that every time that tailor measures an inseam, it's going to be a little bit longer than what it really is. And if you were mm -hmm. to take all that data and say, what's the average inseam length? Then, then systematically, that yes. is going to be skewed just because the, the simple tool that was being used to measure. Okay. So there's, you know, you can get measurement bias from tools, but there's also a way to get measurement bias with the method of measuring. Okay, so here in example three, a highway engineer says, okay, we need to measure traffic speeds on the expressway. How can we do it economically? Well, let's have police officers patrol the highway. They're out there anyway. They're out there anyways. Yeah. And we're, they're not going to have them chase people down or anything. We're just going to have them take a couple measurements. They got the equipment on board. They got the radar on board their cruisers. Mm -hmm. So let's just have the police officers record the speed of the traffic around them every half an hour. Sure. How is that biased? So what's wrong with that? Um, well, Miss Hughes, in general, what do you do when you're out on the expressway and you see... A police cruiser. Aside from waving and thanking them for working exactly. so hard, yeah. um, I, I, even if I'm not speeding, there's that part of you that wonders, am I speeding? And you will automatically take your foot off the gas a little yes. bit yeah. to slow down. Even if you're going 100, you may think, maybe I should only be going 95. If you're going exactly. 105, you think, yeah. maybe I should only be going 99. <clears throat> so what happens when you see a police officer is that you automatically check your speed and most people will slow down whether they're speeding or not. Mm -hmm. So that what's going to happen here is this these police officers are going to consistently get measurements that are actually below, below what yeah. the average really would be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, it's their measurement method. So that's the method that's been suggested, is that having officers measure the speed of the traffic around them would consistently underestimate the speed of the traffic on the expressway. Yeah. And so that would be something that we'd want to avoid. We'd want to look for another method of collection yeah. that would help us. So let's talk about response bias. We, we looked at non-response bias. Now we're going to look at response bias, which is a little bit different. This is when participants in a survey deliberately give false or misleading answers to influence the results. Um, or instead of um, giving false or misleading answers to influence the results, they may just be too embarrassed to answer sensitive questions honestly. Yeah. Either way, the answers aren't honest. 
Mm -hmm. And so whether they're doing it on purpose to influence the results or they're just a little bit too embarrassed to answer those sensitive mm -hmm. questions, the response bias is, uh, occurs basically when, when the answer that's given is incorrect mm -hmm. and the participant knows it. Yeah. Okay. So a couple examples or, or instances where you could see response bias, not where you 100% will, but where you could, um, blood donor clinics especially. Um, anytime when you're talking about uh, sexually transmitted infections, um, possibility uh, about embarrassment associated with them. So really anytime in a medical setting, you may find that donors, blood donors may not be truthful about the number of partners perhaps that they've had or um, about the nature of the partners that they've had. And so this is a time when really a lot of people might just be a little bit too modest and too embarrassed to answer truthfully. So they answer untruthfully, and that gives us a response, response bias. bias. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, something we both experienced um, at university, uh, our professor evaluations. And depending on how they're done, you are often aware of the fact that they are anonymous and the professor won't be getting them until after the course is complete. But sometimes that's not enough. There's still that part of you that fears that they will see them early and they'll somehow know you did that. And if you mm -hmm. don't have a completely favorable response on, on their performance over that term, that they might somehow it might come back on you and your mark will be influenced later on. So often students, this is another situation where they may lie about how effective they thought their professor was because they may be afraid that their mark could be influenced if the professor saw that and then didn't look kindly on it. Yeah. Um, another example, teachers asking questions in class. Very, very often um, students are going to be influenced by their peers and um, um, you know, it could be in a very positive way, it could be in a very negative way. And so, depending on the audience, students in this case might um, answer questions differently. And that's not just a characteristic of teenagers, that's a characteristic of, of anyone in general. And that given an audience or given people around us, we may answer questions a little bit differently. Specifically in class though, um, when I ask a question um, to say, you know, how many of you have prepared for uh, this this test? Mm -hmm. You know, some people may put one hand up, some people may put two hands up. Well, I prepared like crazy. And, and depending yeah. on how the class goes, there may be, you know, maybe a quarter to a half that maybe haven't prepared a lot, and they kind of look around at what their peers are doing, and they they say, oh yeah, I I studied as well. Yeah. It can also work the other way, and that perhaps um, certain students will feel the need to. Um, act or behave in a certain way or to answer questions in a certain way, um, always very evident at the beginning of, um, you know, some classes where that peer interaction, well, it's not cool to like math, so I'm just going to say what everyone else is saying, I hate math, right? You know, and you see that a lot, um, you know, depending on the different class and how it's made up. Yep, and that's a good example of response bias. So now talking about wording and how wording can affect, um, how wording can affect responses. responses. Really. Yep. Yep. The language used can really influence respondents' answers. So, you know, when talking about leading questions and loaded questions, they're a little bit different. What's a leading question? So a leading question is one where the answer is suggested to you, mm. um, where maybe you're more likely to think of a certain answer because of the way that mm -hmm. it's asked, or it may be easier to provide a certain answer because of the way the question's asked. Mm -hmm. So it's it's leading you in a certain direction, and it's not inflammatory, it's not accusatory, it may not include the opinions of the writer or the, the creator of the survey, but that the question itself has some element in there that will lead more people to answer a certain way than would be expected if the question weren't leading. Would you, would you like to go to Big John Subs for lunch today? That's a perfect example of a leading question because instead of saying, yeah. where do you want to go for lunch today, you've asked, yeah. do you want to go yeah. to this place for lunch? Yeah. And because you've said that, I can't sort of unthink it. So yeah. now I'm thinking, yeah, well, that yeah, sounds okay, all right. Fine. Just yeah. maybe it's easier. I don't have to think as hard. So yeah, I'll say, let's go there, right? Yeah. And then uh, that's opposed to a loaded question. You don't want to go to Big John Subs for lunch today, do you? And that is inflammatory. It's intended to make me feel a certain way. The opinion of the, the person asking is in there somewhere. 
Yeah. And it also is leading me towards a certain response, but kind of out of shame or or fear finger or finger pointing yeah. or you know yeah. embarrassment or something like that. So loaded questions are often a little more inflammatory and they will distract from the real issue. Uh, so and your textbook has some really nice examples that are in the suggested reading that that we recommend you have a look at too. Okay. So that's it. That wraps up this unit on gathering and presenting data.